Uh, so hello, my name is Chris Wall. I'm the technical evangelist at Rubrik, and today I'm going to show you a day in the life of Rubrik demonstration. So it's all live demo plus my slides. And as you know, those are typically fun. So a day in the life. Let's pretend you are all now administrators at this fantastic company called the Hong Kong Cavaliers. So you now work there. Um, this is your team. Bonus points if anyone recognizes this particular film. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. So you work here. These are some fantastic and snazzy folks, but they've got challenges like anyone else. And that's because your boss, who's this gentleman here, he's like, meet my SLA requirements. I need, I need backups, and I need you to meet my SLAs. Now, he's a multiple PhD. I think he's got like six of them or something crazy like that. And he builds rocket cars, and he's been through the Olympics, and this is a fantastic guy. But his backup, foo, is pretty weak. And so he's, he's telling you to do all this stuff. And he lays out the RPO, RTO, just as a quick, in case you've never heard these terms before, RPO, the recovery point objective, that's the quantity of data I'm willing to lose before I become sad face. You know, my unhappiness goes high. Uh, availability dur duration, essentially the retention, how long do I want to keep the data? Uh, the RTO is really the return to operations or recovery time objective. That's telling me how long does it take from the point that I suffer a failure to the point where I'm back online and processing transactions or whatnot. Uh, which is typically dictates how often or how or when you archive. And then finally, the replication schedule. You know, for disaster recovery, I have some other site that can reinforce my RTOs uh, by replication. So these four things are really all you need to support the SLAs. Right? So as the, the backup administrator, you walk in and you find this is your backup system uh, here. And there's some problems with that. I mean, other than the more obvious ones, but there's some issues. It kind of has its own agenda. For those that watch the film, this might make a little more sense. But uh, it kind of has its own agenda, meaning a lot of these backup software systems really don't seem to really want to do what you want them to do necessarily. You have to, you have to fight it wrong with it a little bit. Sometimes it gets kind of stupid. It just tries to back up things like, oh, uh, all 50 of the virtual machines are on the exact same data store. Let's just back all those up. That's not going to cause a problem. It's easily distracted, right? So it's constantly kind of looking left when, it want, when you want it to look right, uh, in this case with a backup system. Uh, it's not paying attention to all the changes that are going on in your data center, right? Typical data centers have a lot of things that are moving around. A virtual machine may move, but more than that, new virtual machines, new virtual machines running containers for Nigel. I know we haven't said container yet, so container Docker. There we go, buzzwords for you. Drink. <laughs> got Unikernel. Uh, and the, the, yeah, I don't think we're backing up Unikernels on a VM yet. That seems impossible, but uh, we'll, we'll get there, maybe. Uh, it's unreliable. Right, if you want it to scale, like storage appliances are notorious for this. You have a deduplicated storage appliance, and then you get another one, and then you know you have to shuffle across the two. And how do you get them to be under one single point of glass? Whew, shot there, uh, and it's somewhat creepy. I think that pertains specifically to this picture, though. Um, so, anyways, you put on your next gen thinking hat, and you're like, hmm, what can I do? And of course, the answer is rubric. I mean, duh. So you're like, yeah, I'm going to buy some rubric appliances. Of course, I would. I, I want to be next gen. Uh, so. We'll go to the demo here. Let's build a policy-driven SLA with Rubik, and hopefully this very small resolution doesn't hinder things. Let me know if the feed looks terrible or anything like that, and I'll, I'll do my best. It will probably be best if you don't sit in the way of the actual screen. Projector. What did you say? We're going to lose a bit of it as well. Is that better? That's Ooh. better. But get a tan. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I need to be darker. That's, that's been established. OK. So, so this is Rubik. All I've done so far is logged in to the system. Uh, it's all running HTML5, of course. There's no Java Flash or anything nasty like that. Um, <laughs> and I'm just running it on Chrome with no, nothing special here. At a glance, you get kind of the high level what's going on, how many workloads are protected versus unprotected. To establish what that terminology means, it's how many virtual machines have an SLA assigned to them, you know, a policy, and don't. Right? So 81 of my VMs have a policy, the other 245 don't. And this is the live system running in Santa Clara. Uh, the SLA domains that I have, the SLA domain is what we call our policies. Right? So I have three different SLA domains or three different policies in the system. And it breaks down the <coughs> minimum amount of time it'll go uh, between backups. It's a little small to see, I know. Uh, four hours for gold, one day for bronze. And there's also a silver, which is 12 hours. You can't see. And then just a high level uh, list of activities that are going on. It's completing backups for various workloads in the system. Right? There's a little bit of other information in the dashboard here. How many live mounts are running? I'll go into that in the third part of my demo here. As well as the system is thumbs up, everything's good, check mark, nothing's broken. And how many incoming backups are going right now? So actually there's five incoming snapshots. I'm ingesting 
five different endpoints right now. So it's just letting me know. And this system is running with, uh, there's about 4,576 backups known to this system. That's how many it's taken. Uh, that, the snapshot is a backup. Uh, that's the terminology we use. And 88.3% data reduction. So globally, we've you know, siphoned out 88.3% of the physical data uh, or the, the logical data, so we don't have to write it somewhere. Right? So it's a pretty reasonable deduplication number, I would say. And then this last number is telling me how much have I put into my archive. In this case, this lab is using S3 as its archive target. It could be whatever you want. So 558 gigabytes of data across that 4,500 backups lives in S3, which is half, half a terabyte. It's, it's really not that much. And then you can see it's a one brick system with four nodes, and I'm using about Chris, two and a half terabytes. Chris, you might have answered this before. Maybe I didn't pay enough attention. But the, um, the, so the, the S3 archive there, that, that amount of data, is, that's set as part of the policy rotation. So at this particular age of data, it should go to the archive. So right, let's go to an SLA and I'll show you exactly that. Because right. that's, that's, that's the first task in Hong Kong Cavalier backup world that we're doing here. So I can either go to the SLA domains themselves, and a point of clarity here, we have local and remote because systems can replicate to one another. So local are SLA domains defined locally on this cluster, whereas remote are the SLA domains that I can see on a remote partner that are coming into me. Right? So I can see both directions. So I'm going to go to my local domains, and I can see there's a couple here. Bronze, silver, gold come out of the box, 4, 12, and 24 hour RPO, but they're all toggleable. So here you can see how many VMs are associated with each policy, as well as how many backups have been taken for that policy. And are we archiving or replicating? Because that's set on a per policy basis. Let's go into gold. So, so the, yes, the SLA is an RPO level, not RPO, RTO? I'll edit it. So this is, a, this is an SLA. I mean, the answer is <coughs> yes, it, it is all of those things. Oops. I right clicked. There we go. So if I edit a policy, this is everything you need to actually dictate on there. The name is at the top. I'm going to skip past that. The SLA agreement is the RPO and the availability for those RPOs. So the first one is take a snapshot every four hours. Keep it does, doesn't days. specify the archive level or archive. It's a little further down. A little further down. <laughs> Give me a moment. It's down here. I'll get to it. I'll what are these tables being? He's telling you to scroll faster. <laughs> OK, fine. There we go. If I had a bigger screen, it would totally, it's like a 3,000 resolution screen, but I can only show you 1,200. Yes, that's all down here. Absolutely. I kid. Uh, so the archiving policy is there. If you wanted to do an instant archive, it means, hey, catch up. I had some things that hadn't been archived. It's a new policy. I just want to throw it all into archive. I'm enabling that fresh. I can check the box. But enabling archive tells it, with this little slider bar, how many days to keep on the appliance, basically on premises, versus in whatever you're archiving to. The slider bar doesn't care what you're archiving to. It just cares how many days you want to retain for, uh, local versus elsewhere. So are your customers using archiving or replication for the disaster recovery site? For disaster recovery specifically, yeah. it's a little more about replication so okay. that they can have that really low RTO in a secondary site because that's really the killer, right? If I, have, if I archive very quickly, I mean, they, they obviously archive as well just to support like long-term, you know, seven-year data retention, something like that. Uh, but if they're looking for DR, they're going to replicate. Okay. And you can do one, both, or neither uh, within... The, the policy itself. So this policy is both archiving and replicating. And then do you have to have an appliance in DR? Correct. You would need appliance in DR. We do cluster to cluster replication at the SLA level. Okay. And is it automatic failover? As in like is the VMs it just pop up kind of thing? No, is it automatically aware that the other the other node in the cluster went down and that it needs to kind of pick up and do the work? like locally a node fail and the other nodes take up for it. The, the, the cluster that's local doesn't really, yeah, it, it doesn't impact the cluster to lose a node. Okay. Uh, the other nodes, because as Nitro was saying, it's all distributed scheduling and tasking and things like that. It'll just say, yeah, you have a node failure. That green check mark would change to a red X saying there's a problem. But the other nodes would be cognizant of that because it could just be a network cut. The node could be fine. And okay. it just says, I can't reach anybody. Something's wrong. But, but you will have the ability to go and instantly recover those VMs from the failed site on the recovery on the DR site. Okay. So you, your recovery time again is once you've detected it, your recovery time is near zero. Right. Okay. Right. Something also to note is uh, unlike traditional DR where you have to break the DR to power on something on the remote site, in rubric you can keep the DR and still power on a virtual machine on the remote site. And right. whenever you write to it, it writes delta patches and not impacts the DR state. Yeah, I think 
I think the takeaway for me is just making sure that everyone understands that node failure is largely irrelevant for rubric, right? We can, we can handle that. Uh, if you lost the whole site, sure. it would just say, well, my paired yeah. site is down. Would you like to start restoring VMs? Something yeah. like that. And that could you, could you scroll sense. back up this major, major screen here, sure. here? So you're keeping now you the, to scroll up? Scroll the down. one scroll year up. one year snapshot for two years, but you're, you're archiving after 48 days. Right. So the service level agreement is dictating the life cycle of the data regardless of where it is. Archive, replication, wherever. Right. Well, the replication is control down here just saying how many days to keep in another site. It's almost like an extra copy. Say, for 14 days, keep all the data in two sites. Okay. The archive is more, where does it start and where should it end up? I start on the brick, I end up in an archive of some sort. Right? So they're, they're solving two different problems. And I didn't see anywhere where you could enable deduplication or compression at, at a, a snapshot level or SLA level. Because you want to turn it off? Yeah, you know, let's say you wanted to be able to restore your terabytes of data faster or something like that. But it, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't recover needed, right? There's no, there's no way to do that. Is that what you're telling me? No, RTO is, to do it. RTO is near zero in our platform. You don't have to worry about RTO. And since there is no restoration step... How can you, can you not have to worry about RTO? Because it's 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 basically the time you need to boot up. Tell the me game. how quickly you can you can re re you know restore a terabyte. <laughs> It doesn't matter. 35 seconds? Oh, he had that. Yeah, so if I want to use your system as the NFS store, that's correct. But I want to use the, you know, the servers, the rack of servers I got over there. It's going to be, you know. So then, then, you motion. Motion. then you do a storage motion. Then you do storage motion to get it into, <laughs> into that. Storage track. motion of a terabyte will take? But, but there is no RTO. Five days. <laughs> but your, but your, your service is up, right? Your service is up immediately. RTO is no impact on a storage motion because yeah. VMware is, keeps it on. Yeah, I think the important takeaway is, is there an important there's, takeaway? No, there's no recovery because all we're doing is just exposing the data we already have in the format of the hypervisor choosing. In this case, it's VMX, VMDK, and the associated files. All it needs to do is just power it on. So we don't have to restore. We're just basically exposing where the data is and saying power this on. And then at your leisure... So you guys support VVols and all that stuff? Do we support VVols? Yeah, you're, you're, you're an NFS... We don't care store. what it is, right? We, we don't care what we're backing up. The only exclusion would be physical mode RDMs because vSphere, the hypervisor, can't see that data. No, I, I'm not concerned about RDM. I understand yeah. that. But so yeah, if, if as long do you as you support vVols or not, I, I don't. I don't actually know. There is no need to support vVols. There's no reason to support. VVOLs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because you're in an NFS data store. Yeah. yeah. We're just asking the API give us data, and then the host's IP is connecting to our IP and sending. Because it. we are not the primary storage platform. What we are giving you if is. If you're going to restore a terabyte in five seconds, you become a primary storage platform. For, until, until you recover your primary system, and after that, you do storage vMotion. Yeah, but the whole point is that you have to do a storage vMotion. And from an operational perspective, that's, you know, not, not a really good idea, especially if. I understand. If, if your VM is going to be two terabytes big. Is that any worse than waiting for X number of hours to be? Yeah. So well, what do yeah, you? Yeah. Is, I mean, but yeah, it is in fact because if if it all go down because of performance issues or operational issues, uh, then you uh, uh, but, have a failing VM uh, again. So in that in that case, your problem is how fast can I move? So either I turn the VM on yeah. and use storage vMotion to get it over here, or I don't turn it on. I can't run, exactly. and then I have to suck it off the rubric as fast as I can to go somewhere else over NFS. And we support both of both, that. Yeah, both of them. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll be a limit. So that would be interesting if you have some information on how fast you could do that. So so that's that tough because it would depend on your network architecture, what storage array you're... I mean, there's like 100 right. variables. Yeah, but so the, yeah, the limitations on the brick would be the... AI or BASA supported. So, so the answer to that question is that our one brick can support 30,000 IOPS. Compare, to, compare that to 1,000 IOPS that you get from your backup storage system. Yeah, and we're not after IOPS, so we want bandwidth. What's your... I want to ship a station wagon full of magnetic tape across to here, basically. So how fast can I get two terabytes of data from there to there? I can, if I can do that in you know, one operation, I don't, I don't care about how many ops per second, yeah. I want one operation per day. Mm -hmm. kind of yeah, I don't, I, don't think it would, I don't think it would be that much different than any other array, because it's, it's bonded 10 gig, Ethernet, 
which I think most everyone's using. Yeah, so how many is it? So it's Effectively, we can, we can extract about one, again, one gigabyte per second because that's, I mean, eventually a bottleneck on the, on the network, right? Assuming your, your storage array can take, has a lot of bandwidth to spare, then your, your network is your bottleneck because we, we are able to stream the data from multiple nodes across multiple disks. So we, are, we, don't have a, we don't have any limitations except typically the network is your bottleneck okay. in that case. So that would just be something to take into account yeah. for the way yeah. you do that use case. Okay. And that kind of leads into where I was at a few minutes ago and I think you just answered it. What's the recommended design like from a networking perspective? Dedicated 10 gig pipes or the solution or just carve it up and let it run? Yeah, I think in a perfect world you'd have multiple. Um, I mean, everyone would love to have non-blocking one-to-one 10 right. gig. If you can do that, great. Right. If, if you can't, then you'd have to look at, all right, is the bottleneck my primary storage anyways? Right. Could I even send 10 gig out of my SAM? Exactly. If the answer is no, then it, you know, the more traditional one to three, one to four overcommits are okay. probably just fine. I think most networks today are still overcommitted. Maybe not at the top of rack, but at least end of row or somewhere in the, the distribution anyways. Exactly. So I doubt most people have end to end across the data center 10 no, gig non-blocking. Some people might. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very jealous of those people. <laughs> and then I did have one more house. thing. And, and so can I look at the solution as a complete, maybe SRM replacement, meaning when I recover at another site, can I use it to automate my re-IPing and all of that? Or is this purely just mm -hmm. backup, replicate, and have the data there? And then once it's there, I do whatever I need to do to make that. So the, dif the difference is that if you need near zero IPO synchronous like application availability or right. like five or 10 minute uh, RPO, we are not a solution no. for it. We are a solution where if you can tolerate one hour, two hour loss, then for rest of the 80% of your applications which don't have DR today or is too expensive right. for you to implement like array based DR, we can be a solution for that use case. Yeah, his question is more about the IP, yeah, the attributes of the VMs. You guys don't do yeah. that sort of stuff. It's, it's not, not in the SRM. GUI. It, we have scripts for it that I've been using, but okay. no, it's not something I would say is a checkbox feature okay. out of the process. That's fair. Yeah. But, That's but fair. We, we do plan to provide orchestration in the future okay. where you'll be able to group application, VMs as applications and orchestrate how you... So actually them. powering up separate VMs so you Correct. get the right levels of architecture up before you, you know, bring up right. other architectures. You, and you, you can do that today using... environment and stuff like that. You can do that today using APIs and people have built their own orchestration. Okay. Uh, yeah. Going forward, we'll have both SRM integration as well as our own orchestration. Okay. Fair enough. Cool. Um, last question. On the, on the replication, um, is it one-to-one -one or can you support one-to-many? Can, so can I replicate from this to two other sites? So we support, uh, we support bi-directional or uh, like a hub spoke kind of, kind of replication today. So you, you could, could have, have a fan in. If you so you want. could have like multiple sites all replicating to a single master data center if you yeah. want. Yeah, but can I do it the other way so I can have a single master data center and then two possible DR locations? We don't do that. We today. don't do that today, okay. but easy to enable, but we don't do that today. Yeah, and, and you still can archive and replicate, right? So you can archive to whatever and replicate somewhere else. Yes. It's just not two replication targets. Yeah, but the archive is off to S3. What, what other archive? Um, Clever Safe, Scality, what? Uh, Scality, uh, object NFS. stores, NFS. Yeah. So, in order to support the multi site thing, I'd need to go and get something from someone else to plug in to do that. Where instead, I can't just say, hey, let's have some more rubric and put it in another site and give you guys a whole bunch more money. But I like the sound of that. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Always give me more money. We have not run into that use case because people don't even have one uh, DR site let alone two a DS site right. for the same source. Sure. <laughs> we would love to have that. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, and let them turn off DDo. <laughs> but there's, yeah. but there's, no, there's nothing in the architecture that prevents that. It's just we didn't see the use case, so we haven't built that into the product. Sure. But the architecture supports it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we've seen some SLAs. Uh, we have our gold, silver, bronze. Let's pretend we built those. I just don't have time to, to go through it all. But now we have SLAs where we've taken the you know Hong Kong Cavalier CEO's desires off of his head and put them into SLA domains. These are now policies that exist, right? And uh, we did the demo, had a great rocket car, great job. Round of applause for all you guys, this is just awesome. He looks really sweaty in that photo too, which is funny. And then he's like, he's not a happy guy, he's al he always wants more, as any good CEO should. Hey, how's it going, Bibble? Uh, he, wants, he wants his workloads protected now. The SLA doesn't do squat until it's associated with a workload. So you've got to protect those workloads. So 
we're going to do declarative protection using the SLA. So I'm going to go back to the demo. And we've, we've seen the SLA domain section. The second thing an administrator would then do is look through the inventory that they have and start associating. I'm doing it through the GUI. As was said earlier, you can do all of this through the SLA or the PowerShell module that we have. So you go to VM protection. And there's a couple different filters that I'm going to define first. Right? So right now, we have VMs only, but I could also look at the entire hierarchy of hosts and the vCenters. This is a, a dual vCenter system. It's actually running in our lab. Or if you wanted to go right down to the folder level and start protecting folders of virtual machines. So you can have multi multiple vSphere clusters talking to the same rubric cluster yes, sir. for backup? Yeah. yeah. As many vCenter servers and as many vCenter servers and clusters underneath those vCenter servers as you hearts desire. Hopefully or more. Or tags. What's that? Tagging. Tagging is a difficult beast, right? Because the... You have to assume the right to begin with. Well, it's also the APIs to... There's, so let's, let's put this out there. Let's say you change a tag on a virtual machine. There's nothing to trigger to say that tag was changed, and the APIs to go through the inventory from vSphere just aren't that robust, we'll say. So yes, I've written the code to do that. Uh, you can have it comb through and either push or pull tags. The issue that I found is that in any sizable infrastructure, it's so sluggish to have to call the API so many times uh, that it's just something I think once they kind of flesh that out and add maybe some kind of queue, that would solve that problem. Okay. But absolutely, I can. I so you, you do support tags, basically? Through, through PowerShell. Sure. You can do tags, yeah. Do you support backing them up as well? Because if you restore a VM based on a tag, something happens to the VM on the production side. Mm -hmm. You lose the VM, you restore it. Well, do the you... tag would then associate with a policy, right? So you would sign an SLA policy through the tag. So we know about the policy. So if you're to restore, you could then query us and say, what was the policy, and put it back using the pull instead of the push. Right, so it's kind of like each other, each system knows about the tag based on the other. Yeah, cool. Uh, so here, like, say, let's say you had a brand new infrastructure just started from scratch. I mean, I could select the entire data center and just say protect everything at bronze. You know, give me the lowest level for everything just to, to blanket it. Right. And then I could go a little more granular and say, all right, within my let's see, actually, I'm going to change over to folders view. Let's say within the first vCenter. Keep right clicking. Let's say all my demo virtual machines, I want those to be silver because that's an application that demands a higher or a lower number of hours for their RPO. I could do that. I could just basically say assign the SLA. It's going to nag me because I don't have some tools on my stuff. And I've already got SLAs assigned. So just letting you know, you know you're going to do some harm here potentially. If you were to go from a four hour RPO to a 12 hour RPO, we're going to adhere to that. We're not going to need as much data. So we're going to purge some of that. So it's letting you basically know that. And then assigning the SLA is as simple as checking one of these and saying, all right. And it, what I like is a little box pops up reminding you what the RPO values are. Right? And I've actually had some customers that, that prefix the word gold with like replicate or rep or arc or something like that so they can see it. I think we're also going to put that into the little tab there. Uh, but that's it. Once you do that association, everything's protected. In fact, let me go to. You know, one thing I didn't see in your, uh, your SLA specifications over yes, sir. here is yeah, there are some applications that I'd like to do backups like certain hours of the day, maybe you know midnight to one o'clock in the morning or something like that. How does that get uh, deployed yeah. here? By default, we don't expose that option, but it is there. So if I were to go to gold, for example, and edit the policy. I mean, there's a portion of the screen I was una unable to see. <laughs> yeah, we hide the snapshot window, right? So you can dictate what time of day to take snapshots, but then that will disable the hourly feature because we can't just say, okay, every four hours we're going to do it. We're going to do it within your snapshot window and it becomes a daily within that window. Right? And you can even specify for your first full when to start. You know, so if you had a bunch of new workloads, you can say start tonight at 2 a.m. Okay? But just like for those that are familiar with vSphere's DRS, you know, distributed resource scheduler, the more granularity, the more control you exert over an automatic system, the less effective it essentially is. But if you had some specific requirement, it's there. So I have another question. Yes, sir. You're going to get to it, I know, but I'm going to ask it. <laughs> so when you popped up the screen before Ray asked his question, it showed Active Directory, SQL, things like that, those folders. Mm -hmm. Are those pre-created or is it discovering services running on the VMs? Those are folders that I have in vSphere. It's discovered okay. the folders okay. because those are my application-specific. Okay, I got you. So they're just yeah. your VM folders. 
<laughs> I thought maybe it would be cool. Discovery, yeah. yeah. I was like, okay, this is going to be No, because cool. we do application consistency using our own VSS providers. And so those are just ways that I can showcase various applications being restored at a granular level. Okay. okay. Uh, so that was it. I actually showed you. Uh, I'll just go back to it really quick. Uh, in fact, any virtual machine, like this virtual machine, I can say this batch one box here, this is where it is. Assign an SLA. It's already protected. It's just letting me know that. And I can say, great, assign it the bronze SLA, and it's protected. You know, it's really how, how granular, do, granular do you want to get? All of it, little pieces of it, a folder for an application group. That's it. You're now backing up these workloads. Right? That's all it takes. Okay? Everyone with me so far? And, when you allocate yes, something to a policy, how does, is that only manual? Like, is there a way to automate that? What was the first part you said, when I do what? When you, when you allocate something to a policy, okay. say, this, is, this policy applies to you. Um, is there a default policy that will have, like, can I just go, make sure everything's always protected? Because, you know, users always lie about it. They say, oh, no, I don't want to pay for backup. And, like, and then two days later, they've lost everything. And please save my life. Yeah. Um, so the that answer to that would be a couple different things. Uh, I don't know if Nature, you want to talk about auto yeah, protect? So actually, you know, in a, a, in a release that we are about, uh, will come out shortly, we actually support auto protect. So you can specify protection at a folder level. At a cluster level, and say that any VM that comes into this folder will automatically get protected based on the SLA that you assign. Yeah. So then, so if you bring in new VMs into the folder, or you could actually say, I want the whole vCenter hierarchy protected. So any new VM will automatically get assigned to the default policy. Yeah. So we we will be supporting that in a release that's going to be out shortly. And then the other answer would be put it in your lifecycle management tool, orchestration tool. Add that as when someone provisions a workload, also give it an SLA. Yep. You just call the API. That tends to be, uh, for folks that are using Vrealize Orchestrator uh, or other tools, any config management tool, talking to the API is as simple as, here's the UID of the VM, here's the, uh, here's the SLA that I want with it, do it, and it's done. So you can just add it to your whole workflow and yeah. be done. That's probably my, yeah, the recommended that's... one for me, especially if you're offering some kind of service to somebody to say, yeah. Yeah. when you choose this, also associate with this SLA or even give them a limited amount of choice exactly. and just make, bake it as part of the life cycle. Yep. Excellent. Yes. That's a damn good idea. Yes, sir. How's it priced? How's it priced? Bipple. Would you like to talk about price? <laughs> <laughs> like I hate is, talking about price. Chris is done. He's out. It is price to buy. <laughs> good answer. There you go. That is. That is a I phoned a friend thing. on that one. Um, just, just to get into the, the right scoping for price, right? Because that's a horrible question to answer. I'm assuming that there's a minimum quantity of uh, nodes you need to buy. So we sell per appliance. Right. So and one appliance has four nodes built into it, mm -hmm. and then you incrementally scale by buying more appliances. Just like a product, as you can see, is very simple product. We also wanted to make buying simpler. If you buy today a backup and recovery solution, you might have to spend a few hours just looking at all the line items that are thrown at you. What we said was that we'll sell per appliance, we'll give you the capacity, you can pack VMs into it, and you don't have to buy any more line items. You buy appliance, and you buy maintenance, and that's it. We don't charge for replication. You buy two box, you get replication for free. Uh, search you get for free. You get archiving for free. We don't charge for any of it. You just buy an so, appliance. So an appliance is a brick, right? Yes. A brick. So you always buy four nodes. Yes. So that means that you're... Uh, Granularity, sorry, for scaling is four nodes. Yes, yeah. we have two models. Uh, one is the higher density model, other one is the lower density model. Mm -hmm. So essentially, conceptually, you can incrementally scale it by two to three hundred virtual machines. And uh, exactly, yeah. So one brick will. One brick can hold up to the higher density brick can hold up to like five to six hundred virtual machine. Lower density box holds up to two to three hundred virtual machine. You can mix and match. There you go. Yeah, and I think it's important when you brought up there's there's no licensing, right? You, you own everything. All right. Uh, there we go. Demo's good. Great job. Woo! He's a, he's a cool boss. I like this guy. Uh, no, I don't like this guy anymore. He wants to restore. Like I said, restoring, that's yeah. where the magic is, right? All the rest of stuff. All the rest of stuff is like, that's cool, but if I can't get the data back, you I'll just bought a very expensive right? piece of metal. <laughs> so let's restore some stuff. And in this case, our CEO, for some reason, he has this thing for watermelons. I don't know if anyone's seen. Yes. Like what? We'll tell you later. Yeah, we'll tell you later. It's good stuff. And he wants his watermelon back. 
Okay, and there's a watermelon file, and I don't know, I'm trying to, trying to make it interesting. I know you've been hearing technical stuff all day. Uh, so we're going to do a predictive search from the guys who like invented that stuff, that work at Rubrik, uh, and made that stuff the, the awesomeness that it is. Everyone knows how to use Google, right? You've heard of it? Okay, cool. Uh, so we're going to do some, I call it ridiculously simple restores, because just regular simple restores didn't sound cool. So I actually went to my demo picture now. So let's find the watermelon file. So my boss, he, he's, he said, well, it's, it's on, well, it's, you know what, it's actually my virtual machine. I didn't go far enough to, act, I didn't go far enough with the joke to actually make him his own virtual machine. So I'll go to my virtual machine, uh, which is a Linux box. I think it's running CentOS or Red, Red Hat or something like that. And he doesn't really know when the file was there, when it was lost. He just knows it's somewhere within his virtual machine. So notice that first thing I did was I went to the search virtual machines. I just typed my name. I did it real quick first to see if he even noticed. And then now I'm doing it a little slower. You can see I can find anything using this predictive search. And as I start typing, like if I would start typing SE, it shows me all the list and it goes more granular as I put in my name, it gets faster, and there we go. It's also telling me some information as I search. Local means that this is a local workload being protected with a local SLA, and that local SLA is gold. So just by using the search box, I can get two critical pieces of information about the workload. Right? And then when I actually select a workload, it takes me to the page that shows me all the details on this workload. So I can see it's been uh, started being backed up November 30th, so it's been a while. The latest backup is today, and I have 56 backups, 37 of them are, have been archived, because that's what's been dictated in the gold policy. And then here we have Chris, kind of, oh yeah, go ahead. Do you have different plugins uh, to provide to different people in, in the organization? I don't know, if you have a dev test uh, cluster that you are backupping, can you provide login for someone that want to restore files from that class. Yeah, we definitely have different logins using AD. Uh, the granularity on the roles right now is, is still being worked on to make that true, like, this, this, this checkbox for this particular user. That's going to come out, I think, in the next yes. Place. Yeah. Uh, to offer more of that self-service, you can only see these yeah, things because, kind of thing. uh, yeah. It's yeah, very easy to use that. <coughs> Choose. Yeah. You, you, you find exactly. what you want and you... Yeah. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll be adding role-based access control so then you can, people can recover self-service, right? So an organization can, yeah. should be able to recover its own subset of virtual machines. <laughs> so if we, if we go to all the backup points, we use kind of a color code here saying that, you know, here's the various backups I've taken through January, February, et cetera. I can drill in. Any green dot is telling me, hey, everything was good. That day I met all of my SLA requirements. If there's any other color, there was an issue, right? So it's very... And it's uh, colorblind friendly, I think, you know, green and, and like an offish yellow or something like that. Uh, so I would go into, let's say today, and oh, actually, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to the month. Because remember, I don't actually know where the file is. So I just start typing it. We want the watermelon file. And there it is. Uh, apparently, my boss saved his watermelon file under root because he's, he's a cool guy. He likes to log in his root, I guess. The neat thing is I can actually look at all versions of that file because I can decide which one to restore. I don't have to pick just the latest one. So I can see the latest one, and we give you little gizmos here to tell you that it's been replicated to the other, other cluster, so I can see the additional protection that's offered. Or I can go back and give one that's not been replicated or whatever tickles my fancy. So if I wanted to grab the latest copy of the file, I can download it to avoid any kind of compliance issues where I'm replacing a file in a virtual machine. I can actually download it to my workstation, or I can log into a server or something like that, download it and put it in there, whatever tickles my fancy. And okay. a little bell, what's up? Can I dictate the ability for somebody to actually download it to their laptop? Can you dictate the ability? So what I'm getting at is like for policy. compliance policies and things like that, where I might as an admin say, I want, kind of going back to like you were saying, like a, a, a portal for my end users to go into and they might get in there and want to restore something, but they have access to critical data mm -hmm. or like PCI or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, say it's but, locked out via Active Directory ACLs. Right. Today it is an admin-oriented product, right. and as we develop uh, role-based access, okay. where we will have the policy engine-based uh, enforcement on access of data and files. So I could say this group yeah. of users can only restore to the original source. Exactly. Right? They will not, be able, to they will not be able to download. download. Might be able to actually download the file local yeah. to their. Correct. Okay. Sure. Uh, so that would be a file, but. Just to showcase that's not where it kind of stops. Uh, I could also say, you know, if I wanted to grab an entire folder, I could just browse the whole file system and say, or I could do the search for it. I'm just showing the browsing option now. So I could go to root and just say, 
by selecting it, download the whole folder. It'll actually compress it, put it in a zip file, and grab, grab it for me. So if I needed larger pieces. If I really wanted lots of the infrastructure, though, like lots of the virtual machine and the files, and I didn't want to download it, something like that, I got two different options. Um, <coughs> let me go to a data point here. The first two options there are mount and recover. And these are probably the coolest technologies uh, at Rubrik. That, that, for me, I, I love these, these two technologies. The difference is mount uh, and recovery both provide a copy of the virtual machine in one way, shape, or form another, running on Rubrik storage. And it's that RTO of pretty much zero. It's however long it takes for the NFS data store to be presented to vSphere, and then for vSphere and the hypervisor to boot the virtual machine. Right? The major difference between... And the virtual machine runs on your node? Runs on our storage and your, your hypervisor. So, but it's running an ESX host someplace else pointing to your storage. Yeah, well, so we'll mount okay. a copy. I got you. I got you. I'm just trying to understand where it's Yeah, running. sure. I just want to show you, too. Um, we'll mount a copy from, what was this? February 4th, 150 this morning. I wasn't up at that point, so maybe I want to look at what was going on. I can mount a copy of the virtual machine. Pick a host. It doesn't matter which one it is. And then hit mount. So all I did was select a date and then a host. Behind the scenes, what's happening, I'll go to my live mount section real quick, is it's actually presenting an NFS data store that leads to where that data is on rubric to the hypervisor, right? So it's mounted, or it's, it's presented a data store to the hypervisor over, over NFS to one of the nodes that it, that it happened to pick. It's exposed the files that are there, the VMX file, the VMDK, everything you need to reconstitute a virtual machine to vSphere's perspective. And it told vCenter, uh, build a virtual machine and put it into the inventory and power it on. So it's, it's spinning up a new VM. Correct. With this VMDK as part of it. Yeah, and you see it right here. It says it's mounting the uh, SEC wall Linux machine, and it dates it at the end with the timestamp of the restore point. So you don't have a duplicate. Right. It also, because it's a mount operation, it disconnects the virtual machine's network adapter to avoid an IP conflict. You can toggle that on or off in the API, but by default, it's going to disconnect that network adapter, right? That's where the differences start to play out between mounting and recovering, right? So a mount is, I want a copy or I want 10 copies. You see their version at the end. There's a number at the very end. This is the first iteration of doing a mount for this virtual machine. Um, yeah, it's kind of like taking a snap and hydrating it, but there's no restore, right? So that's why it's already powered on and ready to rock in the time it took me to tell you what it's doing, right? So I could make 10 copies of it, play with it, do an application upgrade by bubbling off the network, whatever it is you want to do with that workload, which I think is very handy for anything that you want to do that you don't want it to impact prod, and you don't want to impact, impact your production SAN, right? If you want to run a bunch of tests or an application upgrade or just look at workloads without impacting primary storage or using capacity in primary storage, you can use Rubrik, right? You get 30,000 IOs per appliance to kind of tinker around with whatever your use case is. The difference between mount and recover is the recover says there's something wrong with that original virtual machine, right? It's either got deleted, blown away, it's corrupt. I need to actually recover from that. So Sorry. when you um, mount, are you rehydrating the data or are you just still in line effectively rehydrating it? There's no real hydration. It's more pointing into the rubric cluster and saying here's where there that are portions point here is. and portions, you know, segments that are. Yeah, maybe okay. you can go deeper on yeah. that. Yeah. So, so again, the the file system kind of knows how the data is laid out. So it will bring in. So it'll kind of construct that that chain and and bring in the hot data into Flash so that you can you can just kind of, effectively if, uh, logically it looks like a single VMDK though it might be cons cons constituted of multiple. Yeah, and you, you uncompress as well. Apparently, it's, it's all on the on the fly. We do that for you. But you're not doing that at the point of mount time. You're doing mm -hmm. that as as data is requested. Yes. Right. Yeah, so the recovery then would, if you did the instant recover model, kind of the same workflow, except we will connect the network adapter, and if we find the original virtual machine is there, uh, we'll make sure that it gets powered off. We'll rename it with the word deprecated, but we won't delete it, right? Because there may be some kind of artifact on there that you want to get, or you want to triage or troubleshoot. So it'll just be left there as a powered off artifact that's ready for you to, to play with as a deprecation. Okay, So that's doing file, folder, mount, and recovery op operations. Now there's a couple other that are available for exporting if you want to get the data elsewhere, you know, to another vCenter or another data center, you can export it out of our system uh, and put it wherever it needs to go. Uh, and there's also the browse files option, which I showed you, which just allows you to go through uh, all the file system, right, and pick out what you want. Ray, you're smiling there. What's the, uh, what's going down? 
Uh, <laughs> you got nothing. a question or are you good? Nothing, nothing. Okay. nothing. okay. Nothing. So you've restored the watermelon file. Everything's amazing. He's a great job, but he doesn't want you to tell, you, tell anybody about his watermelon file. And that's it. It's all, it's all so simple. Even the, the Salesforce can, can demo this stuff. There's, I don't even know why I'm here. It's too easy, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> all right, thank you very much.